Alrighty, congratulations, you made it. Chapter 16, last and final chapter, Dying and Bereavement. Let's get started. Um, okay, so chapter objectives, maybe we'll move this over here. Maybe we will zoom out a little bit. All right, by the end of this chapter, you should be able to Ah, uh, that's not good. All right, we'll have to go over here. Ah. Uh, by the end of this chapter, you should be able to summarize how death is variably defined and ethical issues that arise. Describe how adults typically experience approaching death. Describe ways in which people make and express decisions regarding their own death. Define and process types of grief and describe variation in pattern of experiencing bereavement across the life span. All right, definitions and ethical issues. Key questions, 1.1, how is death defined? What legal and medical criteria are determined, are used to determine when death occurs? What are the ethical dilemmas surrounding euthanasia? And what issues surround the costs of life-sustaining care. Sociocultural definitions of death. Thanatology, the study of death, dying, grievement, bereavement, social attitudes towards these issues. Death is very difficult concept to define precisely. Different cultures have different meanings for death and ways that it is ritualized. Morning rituals, expressions of grief, and states of bereavement also vary across cultures legal and medical definitions. So clinical death refers to the lack of a heartbeat and lack of respiration or breathing. An alternate way to understand when a person is dead is whole brain death, declared when the deceased meets eight criteria, which were established in one. Three primary signs are permanent irreversible loss of all function, brainstem reflexes not working and breathing stopped. This is the definition used in most countries now. Somewhat different criteria for determining brain death are applied at different hospitals. Brain death is also controversial for some religious perspectives. Similar to death is something called persistent vegetative state, the irreversible lack of cortical functioning, but continued brainstem activity. The state allows for spontaneous heartbeat and respiration, but not for consciousness. The whole brain standard does not permit a declaration of death for someone who is in a persistent vegetative state. So uh, if you remember back to your general psychology class, we have a brain stem that is sort of at the top of our spine in the back of our head. And then we've got other stuff all over. Brain stem is the most evolutionarily basic. It Those functions control functions that go back you know, hundreds of millions of years and other organisms, including breathing and our heart rate. As long as your brain stem is working, you can breathe and your heart can beat, but you may not be conscious if other parts of the brain are not working. Uh, bioethics is the study of the interface between human values and technological advances in the health and life sciences. It grew out of respect for individual freedom and the difficulty of establishing what is moral through common sense or rational argument. Decisions must honor the importance of individual choice and weigh treatments relative benefit versus harm to patient. Let's maybe we can make this smaller. Oh yeah, maybe that's better. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Euthanasia, maybe we can make this bigger now. Okay, that's better. Euthanasia is the practice of ending life for reasons of mercy. Active euthanasia is the deliberate ending of a person's life that may be based on a clear statement of the person's wishes or be a decision made by someone else who has the legal authority to do so. Active euthanasia, I'm just looking this up real quick to see which states it's legal in. Uh, as of June 2021, the only jurisdictions that allow this procedure are Oregon, Washington, D.C., Hawaii, Maine, Colorado, New Jersey, California, and Vermont. So that's actually a fair amount. 
um, of places, although not the majority of the United States. Although, you know, if recent trends hold up, this will be something that will become more widely available in other parts of the country. And that's probably a good thing because it's hard to make a moral argument that people don't have a right to do that. What does happen in other parts of the country is something called passive euthanasia. So this is allowing a person to die by withholding available medical treatment. So uh, this would be hospice care when you go to a hospital and they really feel like they can't do anything else. They suggest hospice care. And in hospice care, a person is given a pain medication, you know, opiates, and those actually do speed up death, but they're not allowed to be given so much that it kills them in one like quickly. It's just you're allowed to give appropriate amount to reduce pain, but that does, you know, opiates slow down the heart rate and breathing rate. So it does actually hasten death. So it's a sort of even passive euthanasia, the way it happens. Hospice has a certain active element to it. So it's a little silly that we can't just go all the way, but that's where we're at with our laws currently. Okay, uh, obviously, distribution Asia you know, raises moral dilemmas of deciding which circumstances it's appropriate to end a person's life. Uh, dilemma arises when the person being kept alive by machine or suffers from a terminal illness. Physician-assisted suicide is a procedure in which a physician provides a dying person with a fatal dose of medication that the individual self-administers. It is legal in some countries your guidelines set, the patient's condition is intolerable with no hope for improvement, no relief is available, the patient is competent, the patient makes a request repeatedly over time, two physicians review the case and agree. In the United States, voters in Oregon passed the Death with Dignity Act in 1994, the first physician-assisted suicide law in the country. It remains in place even after the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that there is no right to assisted suicide in 1997. The price of life-sustaining care. So, you know, as people get older, they require a lot more medical care. And a lot of times, um, you know, in the few weeks or months before death, uh, people can rack up medical bills that can be hundreds of thousands of dollars because they're just being kept alive by, with constant medical attention. So in the intense debate in the United States concerns financial, personal, ethical, moral costs of keeping people alive, the argument is that such care is very expensive. These people will die soon anyways, and needlessly prolonging their life is a burden on society. Many others argue all means possible should be used, whether for a premature infant or an older adult to keep them alive, despite the high cost and possible risk of negative side effects. The biggest challenge in confronting these differences of approach and cost is the difficulty in deciding when to treat or not treat a person, a disease a person has. There are no easy answers. So right now, I don't know if anyone else is watching this show. I'm guessing probably not, but it's a show called Shogun. It's kind of fascinating because it is all about Japanese culture. And so other cultures, we are a very death phobic culture. Um, in Japanese culture, it was common for people to commit suicide under a wide range of circumstances. And that was considered the honorable thing to do. Um, the way we sort of, you know, there, there's this article written by a doctor who said bas basically, like, I'm not going to get any medical care after the age of 75. Um, like, it's sort of like a vow he was making and just kind of his way of promoting, trying to sort of change the conversation around uh, end of life care and the, the choices people make. Um, if you've ever been to a nursing home, you'll know that the current system does not produce good outcomes and there's a lot of suffering involved as people reach their end of life for many people. Okay. Thinking about death, personal aspects, key questions. How do feelings about death change over adulthood? How do people deal with their own death? What is death anxiety and how do people show it? A life course approach to dying. The shift from a formal operational to post-formal thinking helps young people integrate emotions slash thoughts about death. Parents' deaths help middle-aged adults think about their own death. Older adults are generally less anxious about death and accept it more. Attachment theory is the best framework for understanding how adults deal with death and how they grieve. Dealing with one's own death is a process. Dying trajectories vary across diseases. Some diseases, cancer, have a clear and rapid period of declining. Others do not. Okay, so there's 
kind of a lot here in um, this little slide. Uh, a lot of times, you know, when people are dying, or as you get older, you know, you start, you know, I am, how old am I, 40, uh, 42 at the moment, like, as you get into your 30s or 40s, you start to see the signs of aging happening in your body. So like, it really preparation process, you know, why older people are okay with it is because they've sort of had decades to come to terms with it. And usually by the end of life, the quality of life is sort of gradually decreasing. And typically, not always, typically, especially in a sort of normal course where people have time, it's not a sudden thing. People eventually get to the point where, you know, they're like, you know what, I'm ready to go. Now, there's obviously variation there depending on how a person's life has gone and you know, do they have regrets? How many regrets? What do they regret? Of course, when someone you know gets diagnosed with, say, cancer in their 50s or younger, that, that's a very different process of adjusting to that, coming to terms with that. Okay, so our first sort of dominant theory in this area is Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's Stages of Dying. She suggests that there are five stages that represent the typical ranges of emotional development in the dying. Denial, which includes things like shock and disbelief. Anger, which includes things like hostility, resentment, why me? Bargaining, which would be looking for a way out, maybe with God, maybe with oneself. Depression, no longer able to deny. Patients experience sorrow, loss, guilt, and shame. And acceptance of death's inevitability with peace and detachment. Uh, she also cautioned that not everyone experiences all of them or progresses through them at the same rate or in the same order. Um, so some context. Stage theories do not state what moves a person through the stages. There's no single correct way to die. People vary in how they approach cores for tasks or issues for the dying, bodily needs, psychological security interpersonal attachments, spiritual energy, and hope. A contextual approach provides guidance for healthcare professionals and families for discussing how to protect the quality of life, provide better care, and prepare caregivers for dealing with the end of life. These are <clears throat> kind of another approach to thinking about what's happening in this process of dying. Um, Kubler-Ross's theory going back one slide, initially was accepted more as like a very linear process. Now it's more of like a, you know, you can be in denial and then acceptance and denial and acceptance and anger and denial and anger, like you can kind of bounce around. So it's not exactly a stage theory, although some people might tend to move through it in that way. And um, an alternate approach is thinking about these four different kinds of aspects of the process. Death anxiety, <clears throat> ah, this is fun. Death anxiety is anxiety or fear of death and dying. So there is a lovely theory in social psychology called terror management theory. It addresses why people engage in certain behaviors to achieve particular psychological states based on their deeply rooted concerns about morality. Okay. What the heck does that mean? Morality, mortality. <clears throat> Terror management theory is essentially about how people manage the terror of dying, right? So the theory posits that death evokes intense terror in people and that we have these uh, subconscious strategies we use to manage that terror. So the research done with this is essentially you remind people of their own mortality. And this could sometimes be subconsciously. Sometimes you might mention the word death or have them read a story about death or dying or ask them to talk about death. But also there's a lot of versions of these experiments <clears throat> within terror management theory where you just subconsciously remind people of death. You just flash the word death on a computer screen for a hundred milliseconds, like one tenth of a second, and subconsciously their brain registers it, but consciously we don't even know it. And yet there's still some very profound effects on people's behaviors, right? So when you make people aware of their own death, it changes their behaviors in pretty profound ways. That's what the research shows. So <clears throat> I'll read the rest of the slide and I'll talk about it a little more. Health condition scenarios or threats that raise the awareness of mortality and motivate behavior. So that's kind of what I was just talking about. There's different ways of 
anxiety. Older adults, it could be as simple as having someone interact with an older person. An older adult will remind a younger individual of their own mortality, right? People don't like to go to nursing homes, actually, because there's a lot of suffering there. And it just, you know, we don't like to see other people suffer, but also because we don't want to be reminded of our own mortality. Uh, men show more fear of the unknown than women. Women are more fearful of the dying process. Neuroimaging research provides a useful framework for studying brain activity related to death anxiety. Increasing one's own death awareness, like writing an obituary or planning one's funeral, can help. Death education can significantly reduce fear, presents factual information about death, dying, and advanced directives, and increases sensitivity to others dealing with death. So they didn't actually do a great <clears throat> job of explaining this. And I, one of the, my favorite TED Talks on the whole internet is uh, Sheldon Solomon, the uh, main searcher in this field, last name S-O-L-O-M-O-N, Sheldon Solomon. If you just Google his TED talk, you will get a profound insight into human nature. But some of the things that happen when you make people aware of their own death are they become more interested in money and more interested in luxury goods. So if you just ask someone, you know, how important it would be to have a Gucci purse, so, you know, average woman, they would maybe say not that important, and then you remind them of death. And surprisingly, people will be rate that a little higher. It's a little more important to them. Or if you just ask people to draw a picture of money and you say, um, you don't remind them of death, they'll draw it a certain size. If you remind them of death beforehand and then ask them to draw the money, they'll actually draw the money bigger. People will say they're more willing to cut down a forest for money if you remind them of their own death. People are more willing to commit violent acts in defense of their country, right? So like go to war, drop a nuclear bomb, become a terrorist, things like that when you remind them of death. So, I mean, this theory is really profound because it gives us a sense of, you know, essentially fear of our own death makes us cling to our social group. It makes us cling to ideologies. It makes us uh, dislike people from other groups. It makes us pursue uh, wealth and power and prestige and social status. It's like all these actions, all these, you know, sort of fundamental things that drive humans forward. Fear of death is a central part of those things. And a lot of the things we're doing are destroying the planet. So, and destroying other human beings' lives. So this actually is a real important topic uh, to try and understand death anxiety and try to figure a way forward. Now, interestingly, and there's a lot of interesting things that can be talked about or uh, interpretations on this research. But one interesting question is, as people start to live much longer, like hundreds of years, which pretty much every scientist who works in this area believes humans will soon do, how is that going to change human psychology? Um, it looks like based on what we know about how, how death anxiety affects people, it could have profound, profound positive effects on human psychology. Um, there's also questions about how do we, or alternatively, how do we just reduce death anxiety? And a couple of things are mentioned here. One thing that isn't mentioned is been a renewed interest in psychedelics for mental health research, psilocybin, LSD, as well as others. And one of the first studies that was approved, so there was a lot of research done in the 60s, and that's when they became popular. And then that research got banned. The substances were uh, made illegal, things like that. But the research is starting to come back. And one of the first studies was using psilocybin for people with cancer. Um, so if you want to learn more about this particular story or hear the story, um, oh gosh, there's a journalist who wrote a book on this called How to Change Your Mind about psychedelics, whose name I'm not going to remember at this moment because I'm getting old myself. Um, but you know, this first study on psychedelics showed some pretty dramatic improvements in reductions in anxiety and depression and things like that in people with terminal illness. So that's pretty interesting in and of itself. Okay. 16.3 end of life issues. What are end of life issues? What is a final scenario? What is palliative care? What contexts in which palli what are the contexts in which palliative care is provided? How does one make end of life desires and decisions known? End-of-life issues are issues pertaining to the management of the final phase of life after death, disposition of the body, and memorial services and distribution of assets. Prior to the current generation of older adults, 
People really planned ahead for or made their wishes known about medical care they did or did not want. Now this is much more common. Well, there really wasn't medical care that long ago. So, okay. The final scenario is a way for people to make their choices known about how they do and do not want their lives to end. One of the most difficult, important parts of a final scenario for most people is a process of separation from family and friends. Palliative care is focused on providing relief from pain and other symptoms of disease at any point during the disease process. Hospice assists dying people by emphasizing pain management or palliative care and death with dignity. The emphasis is on quality of life. The goal is to make the person comfortable and peaceful, but not to delay an inevitable death. Hospice support includes the option for death doulas, an umbrella term to identify lay people, primarily women, who provide a variety of non-medical supports, social, emotional, practical, and spiritual for people nearing end of life, including individuals close to them. Hospice provides an important end of life option for many terminally ill people and their families. So pretty much most people will end up in hospice for some period of time, essentially, unless you die suddenly. At some point, the doctors are going to say, really, there's nothing we can do. You're going to die. And five days or you know, five, a couple, one week, one to two weeks. So if nothing else, people usually go through, you know, one to two weeks of hospice care at the end, but hospice care can also be six months. You know, a person could get cancer and say, you know what, I'm not going to do chemotherapy. I'm not going to do all that. I'll just do hospice care, pain management, and I'll die peacefully. There are two ways to make one's intentions known. A living will is a document in which a person states their wishes about life support and other treatments and interventions. A healthcare power of attorney is a document in which a person appoints someone to act as an agent for their healthcare decisions. A do not resuscitate order forbids medical personnel from initiating cardiopulmonary resuscitation if one's heart and breathing stop. So typically, if someone's older and they've had a lot of complications, they might uh, get a DNR, do not resuscitate order. And that would just say, listen, if I have a heart attack, just let me be. That's my time to go. Don't bring me back. The Patient Self-Determination Act requires most healthcare facilities to provide information to patients in writing that they have the right to make their own healthcare decisions, accept or refuse medical treatment, and make an advanced healthcare directive. The concerns regarding implementation are capacity and competency. Surviving the loss, the grieving process. How do people experience the grief process? What feelings do grieving people have? How do people cope with grief? What are the types of ambiguous loss? What is the difference between typical and prolonged grief? What is disenfranchised grief? The grieving process. Grief, feelings of sorrow, hurt, anger, guilt, and confusion after a loss involves the choices and how we cope and actively involves acknowledging the loss as reality, working through emotional, emotional turmoil, adjusting to an environment where the deceased is absent, loosening ties to the deceased. The way grief is expressed is called mourning. Grief is a process that is variable and can take extended amounts of time and moving on. Purported risk factors for a difficult bereavement including include kinship, relationship, social support, mode of death, age, personality, religiosity, and gender. Anticipatory grief refers to going through a period of anticipating a loved one's death, which supposedly buffers its impact and facilitates recovery. So yeah, there's a lot of grief involved um, in the dying process. They're, the person who's dying is grieving the lot, their losses. Uh, the people around them are grieving, you know, as through that process, um, the, um, and that pro grieving process continues after that person is gone and it can take a long time for things to get back to normal. Some people never recover, you know, most notably husbands whose wives die, they do the worst at recovering and a lot of them uh, die shortly after. Typical grief reactions, grief reactions vary in intensity, such as sadness, anger, hatred, confusion, helplessness, emptiness, loneliness, acceptance, relief. The most common are sadness, denial, anger, loneliness, and guilt. And it's, it can be a very weird time because <clears throat> there can be a lot of, you know, mixed emotions. There can be a relief. The person you love uh, is gone, 
but they're also no longer suffering. So it can be a mixture of sadness or anger. Uh, sometimes when your parent dies, you know, in some cases you're just sad because you loved your mom or your dad. And that's, that's a great scenario in some ways. In other cases, it's a lot more complicated because your relationship with your parent might be more complicated. Uh, maybe there was some form of uh, dysfunction in your family, like many families or most families. Maybe there was some form of emotional, physical, or sexual abuse involved. Right? So or maybe your mom or dad didn't accept you for who you were, either your sexuality or religion or your, some choice you made, or maybe they were just really harsh on you, right? So it can be like a lot, like, you know, dealing with this parent stuff when your parents die, it's common. Obviously, it's a whole different story if your child dies or something like that. It can really be a mixed bag of a lot of different emotions. Grief work is the psychological side of coming to terms with bereavement. <clears throat> Anniversary reaction refers to changes in behavior, <coughs> excuse me, uh, related to feelings of sadness on the annual date of a loved one's death. Grief tends to peak within the first six months following the death of a loved one, though some continue to grieve over a much longer period. Grief tends to peak within the first six months following the death of a loved one, though some continue to grieve over much longer periods of time. <clears throat> Expressions of grief differ with ethnicity and culture. Uh, the four component model is a model for understanding grief that's based on the context of the loss, the continuation of subjective meaning associated with the loss, changing representations of the lost relationship over time the role of coping and emotion regulation processes to implications. There is a need to make meaning from the loss and extensive grieving is helpful while avoiding grieving is harmful. Right? So anytime we experience anything <clears throat> negative as humans, what we have to do is we have to find a way to make it meaningful in some way, right? If you're a victim of sexual assault, you have to sort of, uh, well, I'm not going to say you have to, I, I can't speak to a whole group of people, but many people move forward by finding meaning in that of some kind, right? And that sounds horrible. Like, how do you find meaning in that? Or, you know, <clears throat> your child dies. Well, maybe you then work to, you know, like these parents of children who were, you know, these parents who had their children killed in like a mass shooting at school, <clears throat> many of them, and that's horrible. And there's no like, to say that you find meaning in something <clears throat> isn't that it means you like it. It isn't that it means it's okay that it happened. It certainly doesn't mean that it's a good thing that it happened. It just means that you can f conceptualize it in your brain in a way that, you know, when something just horrific happens and we can't sort of fit it into a bigger picture, into some kind of story that ho coheres in a way that makes sense to us, it's just tragic and senseless. That's something that's really, really difficult for the human brain to sort of live with. So if you can somehow, if something good can come from that, maybe you just, and maybe it's as simple as you learn to be, you know, better parent because your parent abused you. And like, that doesn't erase the abuse, but you know, the fact that you're doing a better job makes you feel okay about it, you know, uh, things like that. So finding some way, um, to make some kind of meaning out of a loss it, it can be very powerful. The grief work as rumination hypothesis uh, rejects the necessity of the grieving process for recovery from loss, but views extensive grieving process as a form of rumination that may increase, uh, increase distress. So some theories say that extensive grieving is good. Other theories say it can be bad. Of course, it's, you know, can be both for different people. The dual process model is a dynamic process in which the bereaved cycle back and forth between two broad types of stressors, ultimately balancing the two. So there's loss-oriented stressors, stressors related to the loss, and restoration-oriented stressors, stressors present when adapting to the survivor's new life situation. The model of adaptive grieving dynamics is based on two sets of pairs of adaptive grieving dynamics lamenting and heartening responses, and integrating and tempering responses. So we've got the lamenting, uh, which is the distressful 
and disheartening. You've got heartening, which is gratifying and uplifting. You've got integrating, which is assimilating and internalizing. And you've got tempering, which is the avoiding and overwhelming. So these are kind of, again, it's kind of a different psychological processes that are happening. And they're sort of, it's a dynamic process where people are doing these different things kind of all at once or going back and forth between mentoring and heartening and going back and forth between integrating and tempering, right? If you do, you can't do too much tempering, you're just avoiding, but then assimilating is like, whoa, that's intense. I can't really do that for too long either, right? So you can only kind of like assimilate for so long and then you might, you know, feel heartened and you remember someone you feel positive for a little while and then, but then like you, you fall back into lamenting. So it's kind of, you sort of go back and forth between, and hopefully ultimately you land more permanently in this heartening integrated uh, space. But, you know, some people might never get there, you know, for a mother who loses their only child, like they may never get to, you know, it's much easier for a child who loses their mother to get to that sort of heartening, integrating space than it is for, you know, a mother who loses their child, right? So some people may never get there. Some people may be able to get there more quickly. If you lose your parent, but it's a complicated relationship with your parent, that may be a kind of, you know, you may get there eventually, but it just might take more time. Ambiguous loss refers to situations of loss in which there is no resolution or closure. The first type refers to a missing person who is physically absent, but still very present psychologically. Second type of ambiguous loss involves a loved one who is psychologically absent, but is still physically present. So, I mean, it could be a person who just disappears, right? In the first case, missing person, you don't know if they're dead, alive, what happened to them. Uh, another is, you know, the person's alive, but they're absent from your life. Maybe um, they're just like a, a parent who just disappears. A common aspect of both types of ambiguous loss is that as long as certainty is not reached, closure is not possible in the usual sense. Prolonged grief and an expression of grief that includes two types of distress that distinguish this disorder from normal grief and depression. Separation distress includes isolation, preoccupation with, upsetting memories of, longing for the decreased to the point of interfering with everyday functioning. Traumatic distress includes disbelief and shock about the death, experiencing the deceased presence, mistrust, anger, and detachment from others. The presence of prolonged grief transcends culture. Some researchers believe that prolonged grief may be more likely with certain types of loss, such as sudden or unexpected deaths. Disenfranchised grief is a type of grief that results from a loss that appears insignificant to others, but is highly consequential to the person who suffers the loss. It stems from the social expectations we place on people to move on after loss. It represents a failure on the part of others to understand and empathize with the personal impact of loss. For example, the loss of a pet. This can be a hard one, you know. For some people, you know, their pet is their most uh, meaningful relationship. Um, and, you know, if someone doesn't understand that, that can be really additional kind of pain on top of that. Dying and bereavement experiences across the lifespan. Okay. Key questions. What do children understand about death? How should adults help them deal with it? How do adolescents deal with death? How do adults deal with death? What special issues do they face concerning the death of a child or a parent? How do older adults face the loss of a child, grandchild, or partner? Childhood and adolescence. <clears throat> Preschoolers think that death is temporary and magical. At five to seven years old, children understand death is permanent and eventually happens to everyone. This reflects the shift to concrete operational thought. Older children show problem-focused coping and a better sense of personal control. Children tend to flip back and forth between grief and normal activity. Surveys indicate that 40 to 70% experience the loss of a family member or friend during the college years. Their first experience of death is particularly difficult as it affects severe, sever, uh, and its effects severe, especially if the death was unexpected. It can lead to chronic illness, lingering guilt, low self-esteem, poor school and job performance, substance abuse, relationship problems, and suicidal thinking. 
obviously, you know, if you're in college and your grandmother dies, that's different than you're in college and your mother dies, your brother dies or something. Adulthood. Emerging adults may feel that those who die at this point are cheated out of their future. The loss of a partner in young adulthood is very difficult because the loss is so unexpected and grief can last five to 10 years. That's, that's intense, right? Very different, you know, losing your partner, probably, you know, child is you know, certainly at the top in terms of hardest to cope with and then losing a, a young partner, you know, a spouse, a husband, a, a wife, um, at a young age, you know, five to 10 years, that's a really long time. The death of a person with whom one has a romantic relationship, but to whom one is not married in young adulthood is often unacknowledged as bereavement. So, you know, if your girlfriend dies, it can still be extremely traumatic. You don't have to be married, obviously. Death of one's child. Losing a child at any age is extremely traumatic for parents. Um, you know, I. Uh, worked in a nursing home at one point and you know as people get to be older like you know there's people in their 7 60 70 80 90 many many of them have lost children because their children are you know if they're 90 they're 80 they're you know their children are in their 60s or whatever you know like that becomes common so even at that age of course it's still very very traumatic and not that uncommon uh, mourning is intense. Some never reconcile the loss. Parents may divorce. Young parents report high anxiety, feelings of negativity and guilt. Loss of a child during childbirth is traumatic due to strong attachment, even though society expects a quick recovery. So, uh, society expects we have a very, you know, we don't really offer people time off from work or things like that. Like people have to go to work and they have to make money and, you know, capitalism must continue uh, there's no room for human emotions or normal human responses to things, right? I mean, grief, people need weeks, months, years to grieve. And unfortunately, the way, you know, capitalism works and jobs work and like you just have to show up every day. And there's, you know, it's just that's just another case of where the way we've set up society is not really in tune with natural patterns of human functioning and emotions. Loss of a young adult child for middle-aged parents is equally devastating, causing anxiety, problems functioning and difficult, difficulties in relationships with surviving siblings. Death of one's parent hurts, but also causes the loss of a buffer between ourselves and death, right? So when your parent dies, it's like, oh shit, I'm next. <laughs> you know, like as long as your parent's there, at least, you know, in the natural order of things, like you, you don't die until your parent dies, right? Like you're, it's not your time. So that can be a challenge may result in a loss of source of guidance, support, and advice, may result in complex emotions, including relief, guilt, and a feeling of freedom. Due to Alzheimer's, it may feel like a second death. So, some, you know, a lot of times when your parent dies, they may, you know, it's a long process, so there's slow deaths. And, you know, maybe when they finally pass away, it's, it's relief. <clears throat> and maybe you do most of the processing when they get diagnosed and as you see their decline gradually and their personality slipping away, things like that. Okay, late adulthood. Older adults are often less anxious about death and more accepting of it. Elders may feel that their most important life tasks have been completed. Older adults are more likely to have experienced loss before. You know, a lot of times, you know, many people get to the point where most of their friends have died and they're just like, fuck it, I'm ready, you know, I'm done. Or they're just in physical pain constantly. Older or bereaved parents may feel guilty about how their pain about losing one child affected relationships with surviving children. Bereaved grandparents tend to hide their grief behavior to shield grieving parents from more pain. U.S. society expects a surviving spouse to mourn briefly, but older bereaved spouses may grieve for 30 plus months. That's, you know, three years. We saw earlier the five to 10 year statistic. Depressed survivors' memories of the relationship are positively biased while those of non-depressed are more negative, this may reflect the pre-death quality of the relationship. It's a pretty interesting finding. I'm not sure what to make of that, to be honest. Okay, chapter summary. Now that the chapter is ended, you should have learned how to summarize how death is variably defined and the ethical issues that arise, describe how adults typically experience approaching death, Describe ways in which people make and express decisions regarding their own death. Define the, pr the process and types of grief. And describe variation in patterns of experiencing bereavement and loss.
across the lifespan. Okay. This brings us to the end of the chapter as well as the end of the course. Uh, as far as this chapter, I would definitely encourage you to watch that Sheldon Solomon TED Talk. Um, as far as the course, uh, I hope you have learned a little bit more about what it means to be a human. I hope you have kind of deepened your knowledge of human psychology that you gained in general psychology. And maybe you, hopefully you found a few things that will be useful for you along the way. So I wish you all the best. Good luck in the end of this course. Good luck in life. And uh, I will catch you somewhere down in the future, maybe millions of years from now when our dust of our molecules in our body mixed together to form a new star. Who knows? All right. Talk to you later.